early stage of development, sometimes boards are not only providing the governance expertise, but they're also some of the best volunteer staff people. I mean, they're writing a newsletter or they're, you know, doing other things because the organization is young, growing, it doesn't have the staff yet to do that. Um, as the organization grows, then board members have to give up kind of the task oriented and become more policy oriented. And that's hard for some people because an individual may like writing the newsletter or they may like doing. So uh, one of the things that you'll find is that when the board makes certain transitions, some board members will say, well, that's not what I want to be a part of. And they'll fall off and do other volunteer work, which I think is great. Um, once you're at that policy level, then what we see is that, that boards then have to be a little more formal in their work. They, everyone's been working off the top of their head. Uh, everyone knows the history, so they know how decisions are made. You need to formalize policies and board practices. That's what we see in kind of this phase two. And then when you get into the largest of the largest organizations, um, I think you then shift the focus where the board becomes not only the policy setters, but also the communicators to the external audiences. Uh, be it a legislature, or be it the major fundraisers, or be it, but they take a different role from a task orientation here up now to being the best communicators on behalf of the organization. At some point the organization starts getting too large and it needs more funding or it needs more expertise and knowledge um, and maturity, and so you need, well, gee, we need some more people. One, potentially to add them because we nice to get some donors who are board members to add some some funding to the organization, but two, we actually started to specialize. Maybe we need a team that's going to focus on finance because we're spending too much time just talking about the numbers at the board meeting. So let's get a couple of board members that do that. So the board then starts to grow. It starts to grow 10, 15 um, individuals, which I think is a good size board in general. Um, and then those are opportunities then for our boards to go off site to start really building joint mission together. And so taking the boards out, taking them and working them with management teams um, and having them connect to the mission because they see it, taking the boards to where you do the service. And so you start understanding the mission better and understanding how then you're going to come back and what things you can do together. Um, and then the boards themselves start looking at the rest of the outside world. They allow the management team to not forget that there's a larger world out there and lots of others working in similar areas so they can hold the management team accountable saying, I know you're trying to get stuff done, but don't forget to look up occasionally and make sure we're still aligned as to where we're working or the opportunities are working and then let's bear down again and get stuff done too. The oversight role is always there, the fiduciary oversight and the oversight of the boards of the organisation's legal and fiduciary responsibilities. But then I think comes a time when the board is there really as a resource to help to collectively to decide where is it we want to go, what is it that, what do we want to achieve, what do we need in order to get there, and how can, how does this board function in order to take us to that point. And that's going to mean looking at the people who come onto the board, your succession planning and your um, tracking of who is available to come onto your board, um, the kinds of roles and responsibilities you, that you find for them. And it's really important for the board and the chair to find roles which energise and excite people who are coming onto the board. There's got to be a fit for them so that they feel that they're making a contribution. More mature organisations often have a couple of different types of pivot points. Um, one pivot point might occur um, when there is a change in the financial situation of an organization, right? A major donor changes um, its, his or her focus. Um, uh, 2008 <laughs> happens and the money that you thought you were going to be able to raise doesn't happen. Um, organizations also um, um, have pivot points when some things in the market change. Um, so a need that um, existed is no longer a major need or another provider comes in to provide that service. Um, or you realize there's actually a huge population that actually has a related need that um, you as an organization want to serve. Um, and so the board being able to actually be ready for and have the capability of helping an organization navigate through those pivot points is incredibly important. And then of course the other really important pivot point is when 
when there's a succession, when there's a change in leadership, either because the existing leader is not uh, no longer a good fit for where the organization needs to go, or because they're naturally transitioning out for some other reason. Um, and the board really needs to step up in that time um, and really navigate um, the organization through um, a really significant change. Thank you.